we really have an amazing group for you. So let me introduce our speakers in the order in which they will speak to you with their initial remarks. First will be Lucinda Lowe. Lucinda is a partner in Washington, D.C. at Steptoe & Johnson, and her practice includes representing audit committees, boards of directors, companies in internal government and international financial institution audits and investigations. She's recognized by Chambers as, a, as an incredible technical proficient and spectacularly uh, eloquent advocate with cultural know-how. Uh, she has significant expertise in the US for Corrupt Foreign Practices Act, as well as in general anti-corruption and compliance matters. Very importantly for the panel as well, she is an outgoing president of the American Society of International Law and has been an influential thought leader on international law and transnational law. Second, uh, Julia Simon will speak to us from the inside perspective. Julia is chief legal officer and chief diversity officer at Mary Kay, where she oversees the company's legal risk management governance and compliance, as well as corporate communications and corporate social responsibility functions. She also serves as both the senior privacy officer and chief diversity officer of the company and has 30 years of legal experience in private practice and in-house position, has held many roles since joining Mary Kate's legal department in 2000 and was instrumental in creating the company's global data privacy compliance program, as well as leading litigation strategies that positively impacted the direct sales industry. Prior to joining Mary Kay, Julia was a partner at Lock Liddell and SAP in Dallas. And then finally, we will hear from David Atanasio. David is a senior associate in Washington, D.C. at Deckard, where he concentrates his practice on international arbitration and international litigation matters, especially those with difficult issues of public international law or foreign law. He's been recognized in Chambers USA, as well as who's, who's legal as an arbitration future leader, and um, has experience in various arbitrations that touch precisely on the questions that we're going to talk about today, which is corporate diplomacy. Before I get you started, let me say just a couple of words on what on earth it is that I mean by corporate diplomacy, because that's not necessarily a term that we're familiar with in the legal industry, but is a term that is both reasonably common in foreign policy circles, as well as on the business side. So what I mean by that, just to catch us all up, is a senior level capability to build and maintain relationships with foreign external stakeholders. And the success of corporate diplomacy lies in meeting the needs of external stakeholders while also delivering shareholder value. And frequently it is described to, uh, used to describe shareholder engagement with a, sorry, stakeholder engagement with a geopolitical impact. And sort of one example to drive that home is, you know, the negotiations when Siemens built a nuclear power plant in Iran in 1974, those kinds of transactions also frequently get labeled as corporate diplomacy because they have such an impact on geopolitics. So with that very, very brief introduction, Lucinda, why don't you kick us off? Freddie, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the Southwest Institute and congratulations on being able to resume the Academy Live, which I'm sure has been a great experience. It's a wonderful program. Um, so, so I'm going to focus principally on uh, some of the things that, that uh, you need to be mindful of from a compliance point of view when uh, companies are considering engaging in the types of corporate diplomacy efforts uh, that Freddie has just described. Uh, and and uh, I'll focus particularly on rules against bribery and corruption uh, there are some other <laughs> regulatory compliance restrictions that come into the picture uh, that, that um, uh, as well as other legal norms that have to be taken into account. Uh, 
there may not be restrictions, but 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 still are important to think about in in terms of the engagement. Uh, we'll see how the time goes if uh, and, and see if we can get into those. But focusing first on bribery and corruption, as some of you may know, this is an area that's evolved a lot in recent years um, uh, in terms of, of rules that apply to overseas business activity and are very relevant to the issue of corporate diplomacy. So uh, they really started in the US, which was the first country in the world to enact legislation, actually coming out of a scandal in the US, the Watergate scandal 50 years ago, uh, uh, led, led to the discovery of, of the fact that companies were, US companies were making improper payments to get overseas contracts. And that in turn led to a statute does, uh, a number of you have probably heard of and maybe dealt with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, um, which for 25 years stood alone as the only statute in the world uh, to prescribe overseas bribery. Of course, every country has regimes pro prohibiting domestic bribery, but overseas bribery, the attitude was, well, when in Rome, you know, Follow, follow the local standards. So the FCPA uh, went against that. And eventually there were treaties that were adopted in the OECD, in the UN regionally uh, that have internationalized this, this, this rule. So we now have other statutes like the UK Bribery Act, the Brazilian Clean Company Act, uh, more recently Sapin de in France or Canada's Corruption of Public Officials Act and some others and the World Bank and other multilateral development banks who finance a lot of projects uh, that are development focused also have their own, uh, uh, their own rules. Now, most of these rules are focused on public sector bribery, although there's an increasing trend to cover private sector uh, bribery as well as we see in the in the UK bribery statute. Uh, and some of these laws like the FCPA don't just proscribe bribery, but they also contain either accounting requirements uh, or requirements for companies to maintain programs of internal control to, to uh, 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 basically manage and control where money is spent. And these requirements have grown significantly in recent years. But I'm going to focus for a moment on bribery and perhaps explode some of the myths that surround this area because people are often surprised by the scope of these statutes. It's not just the typical things you would think of as bribery, suitcases of money uh, to get contracts that are covered, but it can be things like jobs for relatives or friends, in kind benefits like gifts and entertainment, travel. Uh, contracts, housing, cars, uh, contributions to social or charitable organizations, or other kinds of social benefits that are capable of being diverted or event sponsorship. So those are the, uh, uh, the broad range of benefits that are typically covered by these statutes. There's also a broad sweep in terms of the types of recipients who are typically covered by these statutes. Some of it again is pretty obvious. Anybody for statutes that apply to government officials, anybody you would normally think of as being a government official is going to be covered from the president or the prime minister uh, on down uh, in the national government. But it's also going to be officials at the state or local level. It can even include tribal officials, depending on their function in the national legal system. And you have to look at that pretty closely to figure it out. It can even include people who are not uh, typically government officials, but are hired by the government to carry out a particular job like a land surveyor uh, or security officials, military and police, legislators, judges, officials of state owned enterprises. This is very important. The water company, the gas company, the electric company, all those utilities, the media, if it's state, owned, which it often is, at least in part, in many countries. Uh, some of the laws like the FCPA also include political parties, not individuals, but the parties, 
as well as party officials and candidates. And dealings with family members of people who are officials is an area that's particularly tricky. The royal family in parts of the Middle East, but also elsewhere, the, the uh, family members who are really part of an economic unit with the official. Uh, so there's a broad swath of covered people. And, and uh, while not all dealings with people who are officials are outright prohibited, there are these tripwires where if you give benefits to them personally, as opposed to the government for an improper purpose, then you can be entering a zone of, of, of danger. And that applies whether it happens directly or indirectly. In other words, these laws say you can't close your eyes and say, I'm going to hire this consultant to do what I, you know, what I can't do directly, uh, uh, and, and, uh, but I'll use them. That, that doesn't work. That doesn't work either. So how do these issues present themselves in the corporate diplomacy context? Well, in lots of ways. I think the risks are probably biggest for those companies that are part of long-term foreign investment projects, extractive industries, telecommunications, where there's a heavy local footprint for a long time. Uh, and and uh, particularly for the extractives, you have to go where the resources are. And that may be places where governance is really weak uh, and, and public infrastructure is poor. So companies do want to be good citizens. They do want to exercise uh, corporate responsibility, and there's there, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's wonderful. You just have to recognize where the tripwires are, because there can be some tensions uh, uh, between corporate responsibility and the execution of products and these 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 laws. I've worked with CSR teams in various companies over the years who often prioritize getting along with the local community and may be a little reluctant to recognize when their activities are starting to raise issues. But the takeaway message is these issues can often be managed successfully if people recognize them early on and, and develop controls and safeguards to make sure that the legitimate purpose that they have is, is carried out. But the kinds of things you run into in some of these local communities, everybody wants a job. If not for themselves, then for their brother or their cousin. Uh, can you do that? Can you give them a job? And, and, and uh, uh, what if they're really not qualified? Some major companies have gotten into big trouble uh, for their princelings job programs in Asia, for instance, and others. Or officials may come and ask for support for a, a charity or to build a hospital or for some other local event or to set up a scholarship fund for needy children. Again, maybe totally legitimate purposes, but, but, but uh, you typically don't wanna hand out cash in those instances because that can easily be put in somebody's pocket. So maybe you build the school, maybe you take the bricks and mortar over and you put the school together. How do you make sure, in other words, that the benefits are, 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 are uh, delivered for the intended purpose and, and are not diverted. That's the kind of question we see a lot, Freddie, uh, in, 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 uh, in, 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 this, in this arena. Uh, I would say also, if you're engaging in high level diplomacy, I mean, many companies put rules into place about meetings with government officials so that they're always accompanied by another person who can serve as a witness. I've seen a lot of people get themselves into trouble by, by, by going off on their own to a meeting and then there's a solicitation and no one else was in the room where it happened. And that's not a good thing uh, from a compliance perspective. So, so uh, even though it may be a fun scene in Hamilton, don't let it influence you uh, too much here because, because that's not the compliance advice you're going to get from your compliance lawyers. So that's those are just a few comments, Freddie, to kind of open things up uh, about the bribery and corruption area. Of course, there's sanctions. We're seeing those increasingly these days with not, not only with Russia, but other countries. There's all sorts of rules of engagement, uh, increasingly around the human rights era, <laughs> arena. Uh, with local communities, in particular indigenous peoples. There's a whole lot of supply chain concerns that you have, uh, ESG standards. So there's a whole universe of these things.
that that we could talk about in the Q and A if people want to uh, want to get into them. That all need to be you know, born in mind when you're developing your strategy for engaging with the different external stakeholders. Uh, uh, because because uh, uh, again, uh, while not all of these things will put you in jail or lead to an enforcement action, they can affect your license to operate. Uh, both both what's called social license and sometimes your actual legal license to operate and they can have c civil liability as as well so so uh, uh, trying to develop a plan for how you're going to achieve your goals but think through these risks and manage them appropriately in advance is really the key so why don't I stop there thank you so much this is really an amazing starting point to continue the discussion about how does this work? What we've heard before uh, as the day went on was really a question of, well, we ought to engage and you know we ought to have a greater impact, positive impact on development. And here we now see some of the strictures as to how it is that you can do that. And I would be really curious, Julia, how does this work from inside the business bubble? We've talked a lot all day, sort of looking at the business bubble from the outside there was some misunderstanding on some panels as to you know some motivations and what have you. So I'd be really curious, how does it work from the inside? Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm particularly pleased to be on this panel about corporate diplomacy because it's not something people talk about a lot. And so when you talk about a corporation, uh, you know, for instance, Mary Kay, who is in 35 mark, well, more than 35 markets globally. Um, we've got manufacturing operations, we've got um, um, supply chain, we've got um, uh, um, uh, distribution through a direct sales business model that people don't understand sometimes. When you start thinking about how a company, really any company, but, but our company is the one I'll use as an example, uh, operates, it has to be, you got to develop trust, and uh, that's usually through transparency. Uh, that transparency and that trust come from relationships, and so those, those relationships will be with every stakeholder up and down the chain. Uh, sometimes it will be with government officials. For instance, if we are uh, attempting to build a manufacturing plant in China, which we did you know, some, some 20 years ago, um, the local officials will have something to say about that. They're gonna wanna know, um, hey, are you the kind of company we can trust? You know, Financially, are you solvent? How are you going to treat your employees? Um, you know, or what are you making? How are you going to make sure our environment is better? And so sometimes they will have requirements of us, you know, things like, okay, so yes, you can build here, but you have to help basically bring clean water to the entire area. Those are some of the things that happen when you go out into different markets. And so, of course, um, you, you've got to build relationships with those folks. You know, you can use the, the, the uh, local example uh, as an easier uh, way to describe it, we, we moved our manufacturing plant actually here in Dallas from uh, Dallas where it's been for 30 plus years to a flower mound. And in making that decision, we had uh, several uh, communities in the Metroplex who came to us wanting us to come to them. So they were offering us incentives and all kinds of other things. These same things happen in every country you go into, right? There is a, a, a communication and a back and forth, A, to, to, to get the company to be excited and, and, and wanting to come to those, those countries uh, and, and build and, and help develop their countries and their communities. Um, and then also from our perspective, there is the, okay, how do we make sure it's gonna be fair? How do we make sure we can make money here? How can we make sure that it's gonna be profitable for our shareholders? And so when you start thinking about those constituents and you start thinking about what that diplomacy looks like, it could be you know looking at, at making sure there are uh, NGOs who are okay with the fact that we sell uh, our products in a certain way or, or, or how we manufacture what those ingredients are. Those people will care about those things. The government's gonna care about um, uh, whether we're gonna follow their laws. They're gonna care about um, uh, whether there's enough investment for them to protect themselves and their citizens if we decide to pull out. Those kinds of things happen everywhere. And so those relationships are extremely important. They've got to be thought out before you ever think about entering a market or moving your location for manufacturing or your distribution centers or, or whatever else. There are all these different considerations you've got to approach. And in that, you know, like I said, the, your, your stakeholders are everybody from your consumers to your employees to, to the government. Every, everyone is a stakeholder and you really have got to be strategic about how you approach each and every one of those groups 
but also consistent in your messaging across the groups to make sure that um, uh, everyone understands, again, what, what you want them to know about your company, which is you're a good company who is uh, solid, who is trying to make the world a better place and deliver fabulous products or whatever the, the, the particular company does. Um, those are the kinds of things we've got to uh, contend with all while doing all what Lucinda said, which is complying with the law and not bribing people and making sure we do it all the right way. So it's a, it's, it's a complicated uh, structure, but um, uh, from an in-house perspective uh, and in, from a company perspective, it's um, challenging only in that there are all these steps, there are all these people, uh, there are relationships involved. And whenever there are relationships involved, there's just gotta be some thought process and some guardrails around that. Um, um, so that's the hard part of it, but the fun part is, is sort of being able to, to uh, explore and expand and, and you know, good, do good in the world and then make your company a, a great place. Thank you so much. So now we have, you know, really this internal view of the company as well as an, a, a compliance view. And to build on that, to sort of really work us into the discussion, uh, David, can you give us a brief view of how does this go wrong? And you know what lessons to draw from that? Thank you, Freddie, and thanks to the Southwest Institute. I'm truly honored to be on this panel with such esteemed co-panelists. So I'm a disputes lawyer, and I specifically uh, focus on disputes that arise between foreign companies and sovereign states. So as Freddie said, I'm, I'm not in the room when you, the investments or when the projects are being created, I'm in the room afterwards when they've fallen apart. So I get a sort of a different perspective on exactly what can go wrong. I can, in, in many of my cases, what you do see is this breakdown of corporate diplomacy. It's failed because it has the um, sufficient action has not been taken beforehand to make the investment successful. And when this goes wrong, it's not always pleasant. Oh, it's, it's quite difficult to generalize across all disputes because every dispute really uh, is, has its own unique features. And especially if we're looking at this on a global level, uh, and it's also, I think, trite to say that there are massive differences in what corporate diplomacy might look like in different regions, cultures, economies, language blocks. So I'm gonna just comment from the perspective of two concrete case studies, uh, one that's focused on corporate diplomacy with local communities, and one that's focused on corporate diplomacy with governments that are in the extractive sector. And so I can speak a little bit more freely. These case studies are not from cases I've personally worked on, but they do share fact patterns and issues with a number of disputes that I have. And while these, these issues that arose are local in nature and very specific to their context, I think we can actually draw general lessons from these cases. And actually, despite the fact that the cases are extreme, I think the extremity brings out issues that might otherwise not be entirely obvious uh, in a more run of the mill sort of case. Okay, so the first case I'd like to talk about is uh, Bear Creek versus Peru. Uh, this is a dispute that involved a mining, uh, a Canadian mining company uh, that was active in Peru. So in around 2004, Bear Creek learned of potential silver deposits in the border region of Southern Peru near Bolivia, not far from Chile. This was the Santa Ana mine. So it was located in the high mountains, the high Andes. The surrounding region is, we're looking at 13,000 feet at the lowest. But as I think Lucinda said, extractive industries, you have to go where the resources are. Um, and in this area, the local communities are heavily or primarily indigenous with the Aymara language widely spoken instead of Spanish. Uh, these communities are engaged in agriculture, small scale fishing, livestock farming, and they have their own leadership structures and social organization that sometimes in tension with or at least independent of the Peruvian government itself. So in 2004, Bear Creek applied for, some, for mining rights in the area. And after a few years, the Peruvian government appro approved, um, approved these rights. And so it began exploration activities. But it appears that by about 2008, Bear Creek began to have serious issues with the local communities, serious tensions emerged. So at least according to what's reported in the case, by, two th uh, by in September 2008, certain of, the, of Bear Creek's employees were actually physically detained by 
um, a local community for a few hours. Uh, in October of that year, um, possibly two to 3,000 uh, members of a local community invaded Bear Creek's local work site, ransacked their offices, and set fire to those offices. And despite these problems, it wasn't actually until October 2010, apparently, that Bear Creek began to engage in active community outreach in the form of informational workshops that were focused on the immediately surrounding towns and communities. Shortly thereafter, Peru actually approved uh, Bear Creek's community participation plan and held a final hearing in February 2011 on related mining permissions. And in, the, uh, and in this decision and in this hearing, some but not all of the local communities were actually represented, represented. Shortly thereafter, it seems like things really exploded. By March, the local communities had formed their own local uh, opposition group to mining activities. They insisted that the local government prohibit mining in the region. The government refused. And from there, events really quickly spiraled out of control. Mass protests erupted from March through June 2011. These protests were of such a scale that they were actually blocking the major bridge between Peru and Bolivia and causing a minor international incident. And they actually threatened to do so indefinitely. Uh, they also spread to other local regions, local cities, uh, not just the area immediately around the mine. So by May, we're looking at protests around 13,000 people uh, crippling parts of the local economy. And so in June, the Peruvian government announced that it was actually gonna revoke the main approval for the mine. And that actually in the protest did disband shortly thereafter. Now, of course, looking at this from the perspective of Bear Creek, this was hardly a satisfactory outcome. Bear Creek did bring litigation or arbitration against Peru and won some limited damages couple million dollars in international arbitration, but given the, uh, the scale of what it actually won, it's very likely it would have preferred to proceed with the project and get whatever uh, revenue would have uh, been generated through that mining project. So I think the question that this leaves us with is, well, what went wrong and how could better corporate diplomacy have helped? And it seems to me that the major problem here is that Bear Creek never really obtained adequate support from the local communities, never really obtained their approval for the project. So the complete failure of corporate diplomacy. This is a particularly sensitive area, the uh, region of Peru, uh, and primarily because of the autonomy and independence of the local Amira communities. But the same issue is relevant wherever a major project will have a meaningful impact on surrounding people. I mean, and especially in the extractive sector, a mining project has serious community impact. I mean, just imagine if someone wanted to build a silver mine near your hometown or region or wherever you live, you know, it's gonna be something that's gonna provoke a bit of tension, a little bit of um, not in my backyard sentiment. So I think there's maybe four lessons to, uh, to take away from this particular case. I think the first is that when you're engaging in corporate diplomacy with sort of local communities, I think you have to engage with adequate understanding of those communities. It, it appears that the local management for Bear Creek was really unaware of local customs. They, nobody in the management apparently spoke Amira, the local language. So you really weren't able to have um, direct dialogue with individuals, at least in, the, in their um, preferred language. And, they also were unaware of certain relevant legal standards. So when you're dealing with indigenous communities and especially in South America, um, the international labor organizations conventions can be highly relevant. In this case, uh, ILO convention number 169, which uh, deals with how major projects that um, are gonna have an impact on local communities have to engage with them. And so they really didn't understand, it seems, what was in, what was needed to, um, to actually obtain that sort of social license from the local communities. And this is probably sort of the root of all the other problems. It seems like the second lesson we can take away from this is that you have to engage with the right stakeholders. Bear Creek apparently only engaged with the, the closest communities to the mine, which you know, might make sense at first glance. You just engage with the people who are gonna be most directly affected, but they didn't really reach out to the more distant communities. They only had the information sessions with those surrounding communities and they only offered jobs to their members. 
but they didn't really pay attention to all those who might wish to benefit from the, the mine um, and didn't really consider that they might actually take it the wrong way that they weren't uh, involved in this mining project. And they also didn't apparently take into account that the Amairo communities in this area of Peru apparently consider themselves to have a special relationship with the earth and the mountains. And so extractive projects in particular can be particular of a sensitive nature. The third lesson, they didn't really engage with the right power structures. They didn't, they didn't work with the communities as a collective and through their own power structures. So these communities are organized into federations at multiple levels that uh, cover increasingly broad geographical areas. Uh, these federations have at least some legitimacy to speak on behalf of the communities, and they also will have some authority over those communities when, when they take decisions. So if you're able to get the federation on board, you've sort of won over the communities in at least a semi-legitimate way. These federations could have been used to decide how to distribute the benefits of the project with much more legitimacy and avoided this problem that the local communities were getting jobs and the more distant communities were not and got upset as a result. And so I think it's quite critical that you focus on using the, the legitimate structures through which people are organized locally. And while this wasn't really a problem here, in other cases, what one thing we actually do see is um, extractive companies not only not engaging with the local power structures, but sometimes actually manufacturing alternative power structures in order to nominally check boxes on local on legal standards for engaging with um, local communities. And then I think the fourth lesson we can take away is that it's important to engage at the right time. Bear Creek apparently waited until 2010 when their project was already quite advanced. And of course, even just optically, this gives no sense that Bear Creek actually cared about the views of the local communities. I mean, they started, Bear Creek started its activities in 2004. It's only in 2010 that they're really actively engaging. You, you know, how, how seriously would you take that if, if a company waited six years before they asked your opinion on what they were doing, or at least came to you to tell, uh, to tell you? I, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't communicate seriousness. And they also didn't take these actions despite having some warning signs, at least since 2008, that this was had the potential to grow into a serious problem. OK, so now I'd like to turn to a second case uh, and where I'll be somewhat briefer. This second case will focus on relations and corporate diplomacy with governments. This is the case. This case is Stati versus Kazakhstan. And I think it illustrates the importance, but also the precariousness of corporate diplomacy with governments, and it concerns an oil and gas project. So Stadi, a Moldovan national, uh, made an investment in the Kazakhstani oil and gas sector in around 2000. This included hydrocarbon production and pipelines. Now, Kazakhstan and some of the surrounding countries have their own peculiarities. We might say that the government in Kazakhstan and some of these other, uh, other countries is a little bit less, is a little bit more relationship based, uh, a little bit less rule based uh, than in other parts of the world. Uh, and this is probably true in many countries uh, that are um, where relationships really count a great deal. You also have uh, in Kazakhstan a relatively strong president uh, surrounded by various circles of ministers that to some degree have their own power centers. So I think when what I see in my practice, you tend to see kind of common patterns in the allegations coming out of the region where a foreign investor has a period of success before having some sort of incident uh, with the government, which ultimately um, may lead uh, their business to no longer be viable in that particular country. And the reasons can vary, um, but some, uh, sometimes it just seems to be falling out of favor with um, local the local power structures other times um, it can be uh, there might be conflicts over who gets the economic benefits of a particular project um, you know you might almost liken this uh, the, the dance you're involved into a game of musical chairs and then uh, eventually getting left without a chair so Stadi was able to run the oil their oil and gas 
their oil and gas extraction pipeline business for a number of years. And they even actually made a significant gas discovery in 2008. So this is about an eight year period. But by summer of 2008, they decided to sell most of their holdings and receive some indicative offers. And one of these offers was an incredibly low offer from a state affiliated company uh, that they received in September. In October, the president of Moldova, Stadi's home country, wrote a letter to the president of Kazakhstan accusing Stadi of concealing pro uh, profits and some other uh, misbehavior. Uh, shortly thereafter, Kazakhstan, at the order of its president, commenced a barrage of investigations against Stadi and their businesses. These included audits, inspections, tax inspections, custom inspections, industrial safety inspections, and even questions about legitimacy of licensing of pipelines. Uh, this series of inspections and disputes at the, um, that was initiated at this stage eventually culminated in the state's takeover of the hydrocarbon fields that Stadi had and their assets in Kazakhstan. So what went wrong here? As I said, we see disputes like this on a fairly regular basis. And I will say it's hard to know exactly what the cause was because um, the tribunals in these cases don't always try to get to the bottom of it. So I'm gonna try to fill in blanks a little bit here, but it could have been that the letter from the president of Moldova genuinely prompted a, uh, a rethinking of, uh, of whether they, of whether Kazakhstan actually wanted um, Stadi to remain in the country. It could have been a desire to share, have a greater share in the economic benefits of this particular business, or it could have just been a breakdown of relations with the relevant government personalities, including the president. Um, but, the problem is you do have to navigate these political currents and try to avoid getting to the point where these events are likely to happen. And of course, you know, you're, you're highly constrained in these sorts of situations for some of the reasons that, that uh, Lucinda commented on a, a minute ago, because there are uh, limits to the sorts of ways you can engage with government figures. But I do think this emphasizes that you really are going to need a deep understanding of local politics to engage in these regions. They're, these political environments can be fluid. Um, the power centers can shift, the economic interests can shift. So you have to really understand what is going on there. Second, you need to identify the appropriate power centers. The president, obviously, but I think the ministers with uh, real power can shift from time to time. And in this particular case, it appears that uh, one of the issues might've been that the uh, son-in-law of the president was head of one of the companies that had made this offer for Stadi's assets. So that could have been a potential contributing factor in this case. Again, the tribunal didn't, uh, did not need to get to the bottom of the particular motivations. And I think the third takeaway from this is that this deep need for dynamic engagement. The situations change and what was true in 2000 might not have been true in 2008. In 2000, you might've had you know, completely adequate uh, relations with all the government figures and enough to ensure kind of a stable business environment for your oil project. But by 2008, you know, you're in a different political environment and that's no longer true. So you really do have to look at this sort of corporate diplomacy as an ongoing process and not something that you do just once. Um, and with that, I will uh, wrap up my comments and uh, pass it back to Freddie. Yeah. Thank you so much. So We've heard a lot today about, look, you got to find the right external stakeholders to work with. And it's really critical that they be involved early and what have you. Julia, I wondered, is there some internal process that guides you to finding who the right external stakeholders are? I mean, I'm sort of thinking also from an environmental justice point of view, you know, finding the right people isn't always straightforward. How do you go about finding you know, the circle with whom to engage early? I, I think you're on mute. Of course I am. Uh, <laughs> um, so I was gonna say that, you know, I think it, you know, it depends. So if it's if it's a new market entry. So let's say it's interesting, you know, um, uh, David talked about Peru because Peru's our most recent market entry, which is 
probably five years ago now, four or five years ago. But um, um, so when you're before you even decide you're going to go into those markets, you, you, you might meet with your um, your your legal advisors, advisors, you meet with your tax and financial advisors and you talk about, OK, who are the groups that we're going to need to, to um, get on board with us to make this beneficial for them, beneficial for us. And so really, it's it's it's, it's a checklist. It, it is who are who are the people who are going to impact what we're doing and how do we get meetings with them? Who, who are the right people to, to engage at the right time? Uh, now, when you start talking about um, now, you, now you're up and running, now you're up and running the market. It's everything from, because if you think about for us, a consumer products company, it's a little different than the oil and gas company in that we constantly need them to let our products in. We constantly need to make sure we're complying with whatever ingredient regulations, whatever they've got going on, we might have uh, any or all of those things that we've got to constantly engage with. And so once you once you figure out what are the um, agencies, what are the, um, again, NGOs, what are the communities, you know, uh, uh, interesting as, as David's talking about communities and how if you don't show them respect, how they can be a problem for you because uh, they, they, it's, it's respect. I mean, really, that's the word I wrote down as David was talking, because whether it's a government official or whether it's it's the local community or, or whomever, there's this level of respect that must be shown when you're going into a different culture. And so when you start talking about that diplomacy, it really will depend a lot on um, what their local customs are. Like, do they need to meet your 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 um, uh, CEO? Because that's the level of respect they want shown to them. You know, those are the kinds of things you really have got to sort of think through ahead of time. So, so as you talk about who are the right people, um, for us, we, we pretty much know, right? Because we've been market by market. We know it's going to be, okay, we got to have the customs and border people. We got to have the, the folks who enforce, you know, our, our intellectual property rights. All of those sorts of things will be uh, written out from a stakeholder perspective because we know that these are the problems we've had before. We know these are the folks who um, we're going to need to understand our business so so that um, we're not, you know, taxed in the wrong, you know, uh, under the wrong conditions and those kinds of things. So it truly does take a strategic effort to determine who are the people who really need to know what we do? Who are the people who need to know what we're about? And then how do we connect with them to uh, get an introduction, but then to maintain those relationships on, on a going forward basis? Thank you so much. And, and so, so if I could we, just comment on, yeah, of on, course. This, on this too, I mean, I think it's not always obvious who you need to engage with, particularly as you get local. I mean, sometimes it's pretty clear these are the key authorities and whatnot, but but sometimes power in, in and not only at a community level, but power power in a particular arena is not always held by the people who appear logically <laughs> to be the ones who would hold that power. So you've really got to you know, do your homework and talk to people and think about it. And, and uh, uh, you know, some companies uh, uh, will, will go to the embassy, to the commercial attaches in the embassy in, their, in, in, in that country and try to get the lay of the land of people. Some, some companies will engage uh, outside firms to help give them intelligence about a market. There are different sources that people can tap into on that front end that Julia is talking about. But but and and sometimes it's trial and error. I mean, <laughs> you may have to learn that you actually need to engage. It, it seems obvious to us now that that it, you should have people who speak the lo language of the local people. But it, you know, it, it, sometimes those things aren't so obvious at the beginning. So it can be a trial and error process too. Let, at least that's what I've seen through clients that I've worked with in, in these scenarios. And I have a follow-up question to that. Before asking it though, I would want to invite everyone in the room and online to use the Q&A feature to ask questions and to engage with us as well. And my follow-up question for you is, one of the key problems that I have seen is you're in a local community and you're dealing with somebody who may just seem to be a local community leader, but it turns out within that local community, holds some quasi-governmental function. And so now you're engaging with somebody thinking they're a community leader, but they're not, they're a governmental leader for all intents and purposes. What kind of diligence do you have to do when you're dealing with those kinds of questions to avoid falling into an FCPA trap? Yes, uh, no, it's, it's actually pretty common because most of those kinds of positions aren't gonna be full-time positions. 
uh, there's not the resources to support the government people in a full-time job. And, and some of it's tricky, some of it's not obvious. So um, uh, you need to do stakeholder mapping and then, and then you know, do a certain amount of due diligence around who your key people are to understand. Like uh, one African country uh, that I spent a lot of time with in a certain period when a client I was working with in the extractive industries was the largest foreign investor in that, in that country. And, and uh, uh, the governor of the state was also the owner of a, 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 the local soccer team and had extensive private business interests. And so you know, he was an example of someone very powerful at the, at the, at the, at the state kind of provincial level uh, but, but and, and so if you wanted to sponsor the soccer team, how did you work through that issue? And, and how did you ensure that it was, you, were, you were staying on side? Now, there are lots and lots of those issues that actually come up. So know who you're dealing with. It's also important from a sanctions point of view. Obviously, somebody comes to you and demands a security payment. And well, who is that? Is that, <laughs> is that somebody who's recently been targeted as a terrorist group? But you know, in these remote places, there are those kinds of risks. And so you've got to know who you're dealing with and do your diligence. Absolutely. You, you, you mentioned soccer teams and sanctions and people who are also government officials. And I have Roman Abramovich in my head, who at one point as owner of Chelsea Football Club, also was the governor of Chukotka and now is at the heart of sanctions efforts. So sometimes you might find one person hitting all three categories, but you're like, but I just wanted to buy their player. It's not, you know, um, but it really can get complicated. And I wanted to kind of drill down a little bit more for, for all three of you about a question that whenever I kind of, try to teach students about this get, gets a lot of confusion, but also a lot of, um, you know, a, a good engagement is what if your local community as an indigenous community, and David, you, 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 you alluded to this in the Peruvian example, has a really fraught relationship with the central government. How do you deal with community engagement in that context when you know what the central government doesn't want you to do is to capacity build for the indigenous community because that draws away from its power base but at the same time you kind of got to do a little bit of both um david let me start with you on that one just because you had the peruvian example was there anything in the case that suggested there was really that opposition between the peruvian government at the time and the indigenous people um, I don't think it was direct opposition, but the tension you did have in that particular case was between the government basically saying that, oh, you've done everything you need to do to engage with the local communities, um, and you've checked all the boxes in our local legislation, and so on and so forth. But I mean, I think it's just the fact that there is, as you were kind of pointing out, there, these are not the same thing. These, uh, the government is not necessarily particularly representative of the local communities in a lot of these indigenous areas of, of the world. So, I mean, you really do have to pay attention to the fact that, I mean, you might almost call it, like, there's parallel governments. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's the legal government, the courts and the army and the police and all that, but you also have, but the real authority is coming from a, a different power structure and you've got to absolutely engage with, with that. But uh, we didn't, I didn't see the direct um, conflict between capacity building uh, of, of the local government. And again, I actually just wanted to circle back to one point that I was sort of a throwaway point when I was taught, speaking before, but I mean, what you actually often do see are companies that are manufacturing alternatives to the local power structure um, in order to check those boxes more easily. Um, I've seen that in other parts of, uh, well, let's say Latin America, uh, examples of companies doing that. Um, and you know that lead can lead to its own series of problems, sometimes legal, sometimes internet at the international level, um, but also, you know, if you're if you're circumventing the local power structures, you're not going to get that social license that is ultimately going to allow your company to operate. And you know, the con even if it seems like a great idea at the time because you've managed to, you know, get that formal approval from the the government, that's not necessarily enough for your 
uh, your actual operations to be successful. Julia, have you seen some of that in, in I mean, I'm not just, I mean, obviously in the international context, but I could think about that easily in the domestic context as well, that you have these massive tensions between people who are, uh, you know, in charge of the city. And then um, on the other hand, you have a general population that is at, on, an, on a very difficult footing with that government and you kind of have to deal with both. Have you encountered that? How do you deal with that? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll use a Mary Kay example that's that's domestic because it's, it's a it's an easy, simple example of it. And then I'll, I'll, I'll switch to, to some um, uh, foreign uh, issues that I'll, I'll, I'll uh, share. Um, so the, the, it's, it's almost a silly issue, but it's an important issue, right? So we, we move our manufacturing plant to Flower Mound, uh, however many years ago it was now. Um, and uh, the city of Flower Mound, you know, welcomed us with open arms. It's great. We build our, our manufacturing plant. It's all great. The, the problem, of course, is that there is a neighborhood of houses um, that's sort of across the street from, uh, you know, there's a wall and everything, but it's across the street from our manufacturing plant. And so, you know, we tried to invite everybody, you know, around saying, oh, well, you know, Mary Kay's open house. But uh, in the end, there were some lights on the top of our building that were shown in somebody's backyard. <laughs> and you'd have sworn, you know, they should have shut the whole, you know, manufacturing plant down because of these lights. Now, of course, we met with the folks in the, in the neighborhood uh, and we fixed it so that the lights weren't shining in that, in that direction anymore. But those are the kinds of things that really, from a legal standpoint, there was nothing. We, we did everything right. We had all our permits. We were doing everything within our, our, our own rights. However, and we sure didn't want, you know, this whole neighborhood of, of, of Flower Mound residents coming after us with, with pitchforks <laughs> because we, we had some lights that were shining in a direction we could change. So, so that's an easy example, but that happens. Those kinds of things happen all the time. How is what you're doing impacting the community around you? And so even if you are legally meeting all your requirements, what does it mean elsewhere? Now, in terms of international, you know, to just sort of pick up on, on some of what uh, Lucinda and David were talking about. For, for us, it's, it's not direct, it's indirect, and it's, it is ingredients. So it is, we might have ingredients in our products that come from countries where the government says, oh yeah, go, go get that, right? But it really is a conflict with the, 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 the natives who, who aren't getting money <laughs> from this investment that is being made in pulling those resources out. That's where you get into these conflicts, and so, um, and then that's where you also get, you know, I did, you know, I'm overlaying this, you know, the corporate diplomacy with the NGOs again, because even, you know, for those 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 groups that don't even aren't even in that country, they will come after us wholeheartedly, and so that's what I mean, you know, early on by really thinking through how will you handle all of these different things, and so yet yeah, it might be we've got it, we have got to. Uh, find um, um, our, our third party, you know, um, uh, ingredient suppliers who agree they're not going to do X, Y, and Z. That that doesn't make sure the the you know the indigenous people are also rewarded for this these these resources they're taking. That you know, if you take a tree, plant a tree. Whatever whatever we're doing to to make sure that's full circle. That is all a part of of of. Again, that reputation you want to build for all of those stakeholders in terms of your being the kind of corporate citizen you want in your community, including for those 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 locals. And so we have a question that in, in the Q and A. So I was going to ladle that in, and then listen. I wanted to see what, what what your reaction to this kind of problem set was. So the question in the Q and A uh, comes from. Uh, Mariana, who asks, look, the tension between communities and governments that we're talking about have happened many times in Argentina in connection with ownership of ancestral lands for which the government has not conveyed to the Aboriginal communities for the grounds, but still without the um, title. So th th there's kind of this title issue between the Aboriginal community and then the government thinking it has done enough and it hasn't done enough. And this reminds me of another example in like Guatemala where you have ILO 169 uh, decisions stopping all gold mining because there was a sense where the government said, no, you've done everything you needed to do. Supreme Court goes in, no government, you're wrong. Not everything was done. Are these kinds of, just so to ladle this on top of it, are these things you've encountered? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and, the, I'd say they're particularly acute 
uh, when you talk about not only the local level, but also when you factor in Aboriginal communities, Indigenous peoples who, who uh, often feel very underserved <laughs> uh, by, by the national government uh, and, 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 and typically will have their own power structure. And, and around land issues, there are lots of countries where there are unresolved title issues, in fact. Uh, lots of countries. And so land can be a particularly sensitive thing because obviously any business operation needs land. And so you know, you're going to find out pretty quickly in the course of trying, even, even if you're, I mean, even if there's a separation between surface and subsurface rights, as there would be with uh, many extractive projects, for instance, you still need some land for, for, for many purposes. And so that can be a flashpoint that really brings to the fore uh, these these different tensions and interests and and uh, uh, you have to educate certainly the local the, the national government may not be happy that you're dealing with the locals but you have to educate them about this I mean there's stuff in Peru every mining company I worked with and I've worked with a bunch of them in Peru over the years everybody knew these were problems these were not limited to uh, the Bear Creek deposit but they were particularly acute there for, for a set of reasons that David's gone into, but but you know it's it's not always you know so difficult, especially if you've been through these things in some countries. Each country is different, but it sensitizes you to the types of issues that can arise. And so next time your 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 list of issues to think about that Julia was talking about is going to be better because you've had that experience in in X or Y country. So. So you, you've just got to keep those communication lines open with everybody who you decide and is really a legitimate stakeholder and not just talk to the people the central government would have you talk to because they may not be the power centers and, and, and they need to understand that if you're going to be there for 30, 50 years, whatever it is, you've got to have that local, that social license from the local community. And, and to kind of follow up on that, I mean, with surface right owners, you might think that, well, we just go to the government and let them use their eminent domain powers. They'll get us the surface right we need, except that now you have some very unhappy people with you right. who uh, no longer have their surface rights. And you got them for a song from the government. And they're going to think, well, how did that happen? Right. Right. Um, right. Or you've got community of, uh, resettlement issues, also very, very tricky, very tricky and often needs to happen with some of these projects as you don't want them too close to a manufacturing facility or the particular kinds of operations that may be dangerous. And yet, you know, resettlement becomes a very fraught issue and, and that brings in all the human rights uh, implications and, 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 and social license implications too. So there's, there's lots to... <laughs> Uh, That's to unpack. Yeah. yeah. David, just jump to, on in. Just one comment to add. I mean, this can really squeeze states in some cases. I mean, and especially in Latin America, you see the Inter American Court of Human Rights hearing tons of cases with exactly this sort of fact pattern where you have, uh, you know, um, indigenous communities or peoples with claims to sort of ancestral lands that have they've been pushed off of for one reason or another. And then that land, those lands have been reassigned to, you know, um, industry or other people in different cases. And in some cases, like for example, the Sohoya Massa versus Paraguay case, you, I mean, you actually have a case where a foreign investor, I think it was German in this case, is threatening to sue um, Peru or at least, well, at least, uh, or excuse me, Paraguay. Uh, or at least Paraguay is alleging that they they are they have these obligations to this uh, this foreign investor, and on the other, on the other side, you've got the communities bringing these human rights claims uh, for the restoration of their traditional ancestral land. So I mean, it can be if you're not sensitive to the actual, um, I guess, the people dimension of this rather than the legal dimension, um, you can have disputes that can go on for years and be you know extremely politically heated. To kind of move from the who to the how to building the social license to operate. Um, Julia, you had mentioned in the beginning that there were things that uh, Mary Kay was doing that were helpful to it in you know, getting 
community buy-in when you open a new facility in terms of water, in terms of infrastructure that you build? What are the kind of things that you've seen really make a difference to the local community where you'd see like, yeah, every time we're going into a new community, we're going to ask them or, or figure out whether this is the thing they need. Right. Well, sometimes it's the government will tell us, to be honest with, with you, you know, um, um, in, in China, it's like, if you want a manu manufacturing plant in the, the area we were going to build, it was, well, you're going to have to bring your own water. And when you do that, make sure we know about it so we can plug in other folks with it. So it happens in that way. When it's when it's more of a, um, a subsidiary where it's really more distribution and, and flow through, then what they want to know is um, um, how are we going to make the community better? It's, it's, it's not enough for us. And again, we are a um, consumer products company, right? Where we're selling goods to folks. And so the question for them is, um, um, is, is just your company and its shareholders going to profit or will the people who are in this community profit? And so what we've got to go to them with is here is how everybody's going to win. If, if, if Mary Kay wins in your community, here's how the whole community wins. And so those are the kinds of things we think about and talk about strategically with the government officials, with, you know, the local residents, with, with others to show them how our involvement in that community is just going to make the community better. And so it, it's it's truly strategy, right? It truly is thinking about all of what you're talking about from a diplomacy sort of standpoint to figure out who are the people who are going to care, whether we're here or not. Uh, but more importantly, the people who don't want us there, who are concerned about us being there. And how do we convince them that our presence either is not a threat to them or will ultimately benefit them? And so, yeah, it could be anything from you know, um, um, you know, um, um, grand openings for, to walking people through to, to showing people sort of what we do. Uh, it also depends on, you know, if we're talking about, are we talking about a branch office or is it a place where we're going to have even local manufacturing, you know, for uh, particularly in some of the Latin American countries, you've got to manufacture in that there's just, there's just no financially solvent way you can do it without having local manufacturing. And so for those countries, we'll do that. In some places, we don't have to do it, but it might be we do some local manufacturing and then some, um, you know, manufacturing in one of our larger manufacturing plants that send it in. So there, there, there are combinations of all that work so that people can go, okay, here's how this is going to enrich my community. Now, again, for us, when we go in, we are intending to go in for the long haul. I know there are, there are other industries who they, they plan to be there for a short time period, sell off and do other things. And so our strategy may be different from some of those companies that just have a different mindset in terms of what they need and what the impact will be on, on them financially from that investment in the community. You, got, you just made me think of that Monty Python skit of what has the Roman Empire ever done for me? And it's like, well, roads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But except for the roads, and they keep going through the really, really long list of things. And it, it sounds like, I mean, I would imagine that when you bring a manufacturing plant, you would have to, I mean, you bring jobs. Uh, you bring infrastructure because you're going to have to improve roads. You're going to improve water access. You're going to have to improve electricity access. And there, there are a lot of things that just by the sheer fact that you are there, will be things that you'll have to do anyways. And the up yeah. cost of doing it a little bit more is just not gonna be, you know, it's negligible at that point. Well, and I'll give an example of where, you know, you talk about things gone wrong. Um, we entered into India, man, that was probably 15 years ago now. Um, we were there about five years before we realized we need to pull out. We're still trying to get out of, out of India, but one of the reasons that it, it was when we didn't do the best job of, of due diligence. And it was, we didn't understand that we were going to have to manufacture locally before we went in. We thought we would be able to, to source it out of uh, manufacturing that we had uh, in Asia. And uh, it turned out they, they every time, you know, we thought we we're taking a step forward, the government would require something else of us and something else. And so it began to, to, to go, you, you know, um, as we looked at sort of our financials, it's like, no, we didn't expect any of this. And so then we had to make a bet. Do we, do we invest all this additional money we didn't expect to invest or do we, pull out, but it, it is absolutely a time where uh, we weren't on the same page with the government as we went in. We, we, we didn't truly understand what was going to be asked of us once we got there. And we had to make a decision about whether we we're gonna stay or go. And in this instance, we decided to go. Literally, it, it, it's taken us 11 years to, to close it down and we were only there for five. So that, that's, yeah. a, that's an example of when you haven't thought all of that through and you don't really know what's gonna be required of you. Mm -hmm. um, 
and let me again encourage everyone in the in the room and online to to send us questions for the Q and A. We're kind of getting to the point where we'll where, where we'll wrap up. There, there are a couple more questions that I had, and that that um, you know involve and, and this that you kind of mentioned this that you know don't give people benefits where you know it, it, it's too easy to say that it's a bribe. Well, it's clear that it's a bribe. You know, you can do other neutral things. And the thing I thought about was. You know, if you build a school somewhere, your choice of where you're building it and whose land you're improving may also be an issue. Are there things, are there rules for how to think about that? It's like, oh, you're going to build a state of the art school in the president's school district. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden the president's house is worth double what it was before. I mean, you know, exaggerating, obviously, but are there, are there things that you would say, well, be careful about that? Sure. Um, uh... <laughs> You always have to weigh these different things. And this happens in the US too. I, I remember I'm from Colorado and at, at one point Colorado had a big discussion about where to build a new airport. And a lot of prominent people went out and bought land in one particular area and then lobbied heavily for the airport to be out there. And, and, and it was, and they made a killing. So this is not just a a problem to Julia's earlier point that that happens in in, in far flung places, but you know if if you're clear eyed about it and you have an understanding of your operating environment and 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 you know you will you will know that you if you're trying to deliver benefits to the local community, something needs to be in the local community, and so you need to have a good team on the ground that really understands the layout on the ground where you're operating. You might decide you're gonna do something in the capital at one point that's a thousand kilometers away and you might, you might sponsor an event or do something there. But if you're trying to really do things that benefit the local community, then you're gonna to have to cite them locally. And yes, you may, you, I mean, in these situations, you're viewed as a, as a money pot, as a honey pot, as it were. And so you've got a steady stream of people, some legitimate, some quite sketchy, coming to you with proposals and you've got to sort through all that. So you've got to have a team with, you know, either within your company, your, your CSR team, your local management team, or your outside advisors who can help you figure out what 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 makes sense? What what's the yeah? You know, what what what's the really self-serving bad idea that can get you in trouble? And what's the really good idea that will help you achieve your goals? And and that's a constant process because these things are 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 are, are uh, especially with long-term investments. You're you're dealing in a dynamic environment, so you have to be very much you know assessing and updating. Uh, on a on a not continuously, but at least periodically, so you're still in touch with 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 what's going on. But often it's easy. I mean, if you want to do a malaria control program in a local community, you know, you're going to know that 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 will help your workers as well as help the local community because it will improve the standards of health or sanitation. It's often the two things come together. But sometimes you get these crazy. These crazy ideas that you have to filter out. Ready? Yeah. So let me try to put a bow on the day and then uh, see if we get another uh, another question. Otherwise, uh, then bring us to a landing. It sounds that the very, very sexy sounding idea of corporate diplomacy comes down to the very drudgery of diligence, diligence, diligence internally within the company, then in stakeholder identification, then in working with the government, with local council, with external council in order to work through, have I sought, thought of everything? Have I checked every box? And so there is a process that is a handhold as we do this somewhat amorphous thing of corporate diplomacy that aims at increasing stakeholder engagement and re achieving stakeholder results for development that uses business as a tool for not just increasing shareholder value, but also improving the communities in which we find ourselves. So is that is that a description that you would say, yeah, that, that sounds about right? 
um, who do you want to start with this? Oh, you, Lucinda, why don't we go, Lucinda, Julia, and David. Okay. Okay. Well, I would say diligence is part of it. You've got to be in touch with, with you know, your stakeholders, but you've got to have a good team as a company uh, that, that you can rely on. I think David's examples made that very clear. Julia talked about transparency and trust and then communications. And I think those are really critical elements of a strategy too. And then, and then I talked about boundaries. You've got to know you got to know where the tripwires are. You've got to know yep. what the limits are because sometimes you have to say no in these things, <laughs> or, or or sometimes you have to say, "Well, we'd like to do that, but you know, I don't want to wear an orange jumpsuit and go to jail." Uh, sorry, and 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 so, but but maybe you know, maybe there's a legitimate way we can achieve this goal. Let's think about, you know, uh, let's think about that. So I think it's a whole package. Mm -hmm. Diligence is definitely a piece, but I wouldn't say it's the only piece. Julia. Yeah, you know, because what I'll add, and I, I meant to talk about this, so thanks for the reminder, you know, because um, I talked a lot about new markets, I talk, talked a lot about as we're entering, um, I did not talk a lot about, you know, processes ongoing, uh, because that's where a lot of times you start getting into trouble from uh, FCPA and, and other standards, because yeah, people in those markets would get really close. And if there's not any governance, if you don't have any guardrails around it, you, you could easily lose track of what people are doing to make sure the permits keep coming or whatever, whatever you particularly need in, in, your, in that market. And so there really do have to be some uh, pretty, um, uh, you know, uh, periodic checkpoints and, and, and uh, constant guardrails uh, against those sorts of things. You're making sure, you know, your, your internal audit's looking at how people are spending money, you know, putting uh, policies in place for, okay, what does a corporate gift look like? Like, okay, if they come in and they want to view your plant, like, can you give them a, can you give them a sample? You know, what, what can you do? What can't you do? And that's where it's important to talk to outside counsel, not just in maybe the country you're in, but also in the U.S. If, you know, for us, we're, we're a U.S. country. So you've got to look at all the different laws everywhere and then put, you know, put together some, some compliance programs within your company so that you, you do your best to catch things and um, um, prevent them, hopefully. But, you know, if you catch them, have some pretty quick, you know, remediation for those kinds of things. So that that's just as important as the due diligence. Yeah, I think, well, I think my co-panelists have summarized it pretty well. And I guess I generally agree, Freddie, with um, your description. But I would say that the one thing that I, the, maybe the major goal here is to put yourself in a position where you can truly understand the perspectives of the people that are actually affected by the project you're involved in and their interests. And, um, and so you can respond to them. And I think, I mean, that is why you're doing the due, due diligence and uh, all the other steps, but ultimately, you know, it, it's paying attention to the interests of those stakeholders that actually do have significant control over the success of your business venture. Well, then let me, Really thank you for a fantastic panel. We've, we've looked at this from all sorts of angles now, from where it goes wrong to how we do it better, how do we maintain it from inside, outside, and after. So I hope that everybody really now has an idea of how this decision-making work. And there are rules. It's not a black box. It is something that follows some pretty uh, common sense if difficult to implement steps that you can use and then see that if you follow those steps, here are the results. Here's why business does what it does when it engages with community building, with corporate diplomacy, with pulling out in response to sanctions, with looking for where we're going, you know, what is what is the future look like and how are we going to be a part of it? So with that, thank you 